answered this question once of the late, great Chuck Tanner. We were sitting on a bench outside the Pirates' old clubhouse at McKechnie Field in Bradenton and just doing that thing that you do in spring training in normal times. Just talk, but mostly you just listen. You hear the stories. So as long as I have this amazing asset here at my disposal with this conversation, I asked him the one question I've never heard anyone answer sufficiently as it relates to this franchise, and that's this. Who was the greatest pitcher in Pittsburgh history? Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer up daily shots of Steelers and Penguins right where you found this. Staying with the spirit of we've got some time to kill here with these daily shots of Pirates. And yeah, I, Major League Baseball and Players Association are going to meet today at some point. Something might happen. We can save that for tomorrow. Today, I want to go way back in time. And that's where this discussion, amazingly, has to go. There are 13 Pirates, people directly associated with the Pirates, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. There are 42 total, meaning people who at some point or other were with the Pirates. Bert Blylevin jumps to mind. But it could also be just someone who had a cup of coffee here. If you wore the uniform and you made it into the hall, you go on that list. But the 13 are people who principally spent their careers in Pittsburgh. Of those 13, did you know that not one is a pitcher? Out of 136 years of big-time baseball played on the North Shore and in Oakland and then back on the North Shore, not one pitcher was deemed good enough. Now, I've looked at this independently and wondered, how? How does that happen? How do you not just run into one, you know? How do you not just have, like, I don't know, Walter Big Train Johnson at some point say, you know what, I demand a trade to Pittsburgh, and you end up getting Walter Johnson or something. How does it not happen? Or is it possible that it did happen? The name that comes to mind for me, and I'm admittedly a geek when it comes to Pittsburgh's baseball history, is Babe Adams. If you've read up on... I, what I guess you could refer to as the original Pirates, certainly the original Pirates champions, Adams stands out when it comes to pitching. In the 1909 World Series, which represented the city's first baseball championship, he pitched three complete game victories. That's serious stuff. <laughs> Regardless of what the rest of your career looks like, that's big time. He also ended up sticking with the Pirates as a pitcher all the way through 1926. He had a 20-year career all in Pittsburgh. And if you know your World Series history, you'll know that if he was with the Pirates in 1925, that means he also was part of another championship team. His overall numbers were pretty good, even if you adjust for the era 194 wins, and remember, back then, wins were, you know, like candy. But a 2.76 ERA, a 1.09 whip. Now remember, there was no such thing as whip back then. Walks and hits per inning pitch, but it's an easy enough statistic to uh, track backward. The way we've seen, for example, the NFL uh, would struggle with recording sacks because you have to have a visual of it. Walks and hits per inning pitch, that's easy. That's just a box score. 1.09 is pretty good. Pitched 2,995 and a third innings, which is mind-blowing. But again, that's one of those things that you have to era adjust. He was on track to be a great pitcher. That 1909 season was Babe Adams' rookie year. He went 12-3, 1.11 ERA. 
130 innings over 25 appearances. And then, of course, the World Series. Did I mention that in Game 7, his complete game victory also was a shutout? Maybe the most compelling stat about Adams is that he wound up with a 52.9 war that's wins above replacement player. And that ranks him in franchise history sixth overall, meaning all players, not just pitchers, between Willie Stargell and Max Carey. This was, this was a pretty good ball player, but was he great? This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone, and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Generally speaking, if the best year of your career, any sport, is your rookie year, you're probably not going to be seen as a great player. And Babe Adams topped out right at the start. He did hang around. He was very good for a long time. But I don't know that anybody anywhere would fairly consider him to be a great pitcher. So you go through the rest of the 136 years. And what you find is a whole lot of Bob Friend, Vern Law, uh, the short stretch of Steve Blass, John Candelaria, uh, working your way into the 80s and 90s. You know, Denny Nagel was really, really good for a while. Doug Drabeck was the last of the Pirates to win the Cy Young. And then you get into, you know, more modern times in PNC Park and everything else. And, you know, it goes downhill. There was one really, really big year for Oliver Perez, you know, <laughs> when he struck out a million people in 2004. But otherwise, you're not going to find a great pitcher. I had written stories at the time of Garrett Cole's arrival that maybe he could be the Pirates' first great pitcher. And it turns out he waited until he was somewhere else to start getting great, as has happened an awful lot around here. So what was Chuck's answer? I know that's what you've been waiting for since the beginning. Chuck didn't hesitate. Chuck was not the type to come unequipped for questions like this, if you knew Chuck. And he said, with his eyebrows way up, as if I was nuts to have asked, that it absolutely had to be Candelaria. And he went over, as a lot of old baseball men will, Rather than, you know, getting into stats and so forth, he would get into anecdotal things. He would remember a game in which Candelaria went head-to-head -head with Nolan Ryan and outdueled him. Uh, he saw the best of Candelaria, the no-hitter against the Dodgers in 76. Then when Candy started hanging on a little bit, he still found enough to contribute to the 79 world champs. And I'll respect that into eternity and actually treasure it because it came from Chuck and at the same time respectfully point out that the statistics and the criteria would never come close to including candy. This is crazy. This is a really important position in the sport, you know? And the pirates haven't always been these pirates, you know? Even when they've had winners, if you go back to the very beginning, the teams around the early 1900s, uh, the ones that ended up winning World Series in 1960, 71, 79, they were all built on bats. And that in and of itself is a positive, remarkable thing. Because, you know, championships tend to happen through pitching primarily. But yeah, we're still waiting. 
We're still waiting. Maybe it's Rowanzi Contreras. Maybe Rowanzi Contreras is going to be the first great pitcher in, you know, a century and a half of Pirates baseball. When we come back, just one question. just one question today's comes from phil and he asks how do the pirates handle individual instructors outside the organization in season do players still reach out to their guys are they coordinating with the team or is the team instruction and the players personal instruction happening independently phil this program has been on our network for about a year and a half this might be one of the best questions I've ever gotten. It does not have a definitive answer, but it has multiple answers, and I can give you multiple examples. Josh Bell is one where he never lost touch with his personal instructor, communicated with him regularly. And by the way, when I'm saying personal instructor, and I presume what you're referring to as well, we're not talking about physical conditioning or so forth. We're talking about hitting. Okay. And the same goes for pitchers. We're talking about pitching. And that can be a really fine line and a perilous line to walk when it comes to the people who are being paid to coach the team and egos and other things that you can imagine would be in that mix. But JB was always very much in tune with what Rick Eckstein wanted as well while they both were here. And what he would do, instead of saying, hey, by the way, you know, my guy in Missouri says I should be doing this. What say you? It would be a lot more like, hey, you know, I was talking the other day with, you know, so-and-so guy and, you know, there's an idea. I wanted to run past you, but you're my hitting coach here and I'm going to leave this in your hands. You do it like that. You don't just take an outside adjustment into a game. Okay, you don't show up your hitting coach, and you don't do something that will hurt probably both you and the hitting coach because now you've gone against the processes that you both think are happening. Besides, if JB goes out to the box and does something different at the plate, It'll take any major league hitting coach about .001 seconds to see it for themselves. They don't have to wonder. As soon as you come back to the dugout, they're going to be giving you this long stare. Okay, like, hello, I'm here too. What was that? Adam Frazier has one of my favorite stories. Frazier was going into one of his deeper slumps, the ones that went on for so long that you forgot about the streaks. This was back in 2019. And along came one day in June where he just annihilated the ball. And then this kept going for like two weeks. You might remember this. It was the first of the really big Adam Frazier tears in his time here. And on the second day, not the first, on the second day, first anybody can, you know, run into a couple. Second day, went up to him and I said, what are you doing? Like, what is this? And he told me this whole tale about how his dad was watching on TV and saw something about his hands, the positioning of his hands. And it wasn't some big, heavy, revolutionary thing, but his dad pointed out, To Adam, the way you held your hands here, this isn't how you held them when you were really young. When you were just getting good at baseball, your hands used to be like this. Well, guess what? There's no hitting coach who would know that. But the dad would. So what Adam Frazier did, again, instead of just walking it into the game, he went and spoke himself with his hitting coach and said, hey, I'm going to try this here. Talk to my dad. He said this. 
Huh, okay, hitting coach, probably pretty frustrated himself at this point with Frazier's lack of production, would think that it'd be a great idea if Frazier went up there and stood on his head and attempted to hit a baseball. So he takes it into the game. And it works together. It works together. Now, I did mention pitching earlier. Pitching, totally different stratosphere. Okay, pitching, every tiny little thing you do or alter is seismic. So nobody's walking out there with anything that they get from the outside. You would absolutely have to take any suggestions, whether it's for a new pitch, a delivery hitch, uh, your, you know, where your feet are, how you come set, all that stuff. You have to run all of that through the pitching coach. Again, Phil, great question. Feel free to send more great questions. We have a lot of time to fill in the year 2022 on this program. I appreciate this. We will have another Daily Shot of Pirates tomorrow.